Welcome to this next video in the playlist on ring theory. In this video, what we're going to discuss is the definition of a prime element and the definition of an irreducible element in a non-zero commutative ring. Okay, so, uh, let's begin. Uh, so we're going to be working in a non-zero commutative ring initially, so these definitions can be made in an arbitrary non-zero commutative ring. So let's say our ring here, capital R, is a non-zero, so it's not the zero ring, and it's a commutative ring. So a non-zero commutative ring. Okay, so let's begin with these definitions then. So we'll begin with the definition of an irreducible element. And I want to stress that people often get confused between the different between the definitions of a prime element and the definition of a irreducible element. In particular because from classical arithmetic you have a notion of what a prime number is. And the definition that you will probably use of a prime number, and which you will have used for years and years and years, uh, which were taught probably in primary school, is actually the definition of an irreducible element, rather than the definition of a prime element. However, it turns out that in the integers, in that classical arithmetic system, the definition of a prime and irreducible are exactly the same. Okay, and we will try and understand why that is in this video, but let's firstly start off with the definitions of an irreducible and a prime element in a non-zero commutative ring. Okay, but there's my initial warning that you might think that the definition of an irreducible should be the definition of a prime. Okay, so let's start off then with irreducible here. Okay, so what is the definition then of an irreducible element? And I should state that this uh, word is attributed to an element in the non-zero commutative ring if it satisfies a certain condition. Okay, so uh, let's take an element in our non-zero commutative ring. So let's take little r is an element of capital R. Now, if it's going to be an irreducible element, it cannot be equal to zero. Okay, so the additive inverse isn't considered uh, an irreducible element. It also cannot equal a unit. So r is not a unit. It must not have a multiplicative inverse in the uh, non-zero commutative ring, capital R here. Okay, so those are the first two conditions, so if it's one of these two things, so if it's the zero element or if it's a unit, then it's not irreducible, it doesn't meet the definition. Okay, so let's assume that we have some little r that isn't one of those two things. It will be considered an irreducible element if it's the case that for whatever multiple of two things that you can find which is equal to r, one of the two things has to be equal to a unit. So let me state that uh, on the piece of paper here. So if you can find two things in the ring which multiply together to give r, okay, so you can find two elements here in the ring uh, which multiply together to give r, okay, and you find every single possible uh, two things that you can multiply together to give r in the uh, non-zero commutative ring, capital R, then in absolutely every single one of these, it must be the case that either A is a unit or B is a unit. So A is a unit or B is a unit. So one of the two uh, must be a unit, okay, always. And that's the definition of an irreducible element, an element for which it is true that if you have a product of two other elements in the ring which, multiplies, which multiply together to give the element R here, that it is the case that one or the other is a unit. Now note it's not the case that both of them can be a unit, because if both of them were units, then when they multiply together they will give another unit. A unit multiplied by a unit will end up as another unit. Uh, you might like to think why that would be. Okay, You'll be able to find a multiplicative inverse, I assure you, very easily. Okay, so. Uh, it's not the case that both of them can be units, because if both of them were units, then it would break this condition here. But one of them has to be a unit. Okay, right. So that is what we mean by an irreducible element in a uh, non-zero commutative ring. Elements which do not meet this definition, i.e. it is possible to find a product of two elements, A and B, and I should stress this, A and B are just elements of the ring, capital R here. Okay, so elements for which this is not true, where it is possible to find a product of two elements which are not units, okay, uh, which gives R as the answer, 
that element will be called a reducible element. It won't be an irreducible element. Okay, so there is the definition of an irreducible element. Okay, now to give you a little bit more intuition for what this actually means, let's go to a familiar example. Let's go to the ring of integers. And what we're going to see is that in the ring of integers, the irreducible elements are the prime numbers. Okay, uh, so let's have a look. So in the ring of integers, okay, so the classical definition that you will have learned in school for prime numbers is numbers that were divisible by only themselves and one. Actually, uh, that's going to be the definition of an irreducible element in the ring of integers. The definition of a prime element is slightly more complicated, but we will see that actually, because the ring of integers obeys beautiful properties, all primes are irreducibles and all irreducibles are primes. So it wasn't actually incorrect to uh, say that the definition of irreducible is the definition of prime in the ring of integers. Okay, so let's just do some examples then of an irreducible element and then we'll go on to the uh, definition of a prime element. So in the ring of integers, let's just take what we know to be a prime number. Okay, as an example, so let's take our number 7 here. 7 is a prime number. Okay, and I claim it's an irreducible element in the ring of integers. Now, why is this the case? Well, let's come up with all um, things that we can, oh, well, all uh, possibilities for two things that we can multiply together to give 7. Well, of course, we can come up with 1 times 7. That's one of them. And we can actually come up with another one. We can come up with minus 1 times minus 7, but those are the only two that you can possibly find, the only two products of two elements in the entire ring of integers that will give 7 as the answer. And that's true more generally for an arbitrary prime number, that it can only be written as 1 times itself, and then also as negative 1 times the negative of itself. Okay. Now, the units in the ring of integers are 1 and negative 1. They're the only two elements that have inverses. 1 is its own inverse, and negative 1 is actually its own inverse as well. And I'll just prove that negative 1 is its own inverse, because I don't actually think that we've ever done this uh, in this playlist on ring theory. Okay, so what I want to prove to you is that negative 1, the additive inverse of the multiplicative identity, times negative 1 is actually always equal to the multiplicative identity. And I know that looks ghastly trivial, uh, but uh, it does require proof nevertheless. So negative 1 is an element that's defined in an arbitrary ring, okay, because 1 is defined in any ring, okay, it's the multiplicative identity. and then negative 1, just by definition, is the additive inverse of 1, okay, which will always have to exist in any ring. So negative 1 is an element in any ring. So I'm trying to prove here that the additive inverse of the multiplicative identity squared gives you the multiplicative identity back again. So how can I do this? Well, it's actually very simple. What you can consider is this. Negative 1 times 1 plus negative 1. Consider this, okay? What we can now do is apply distributivity to this. So we're working in a ring here. This is multiplication. This is addition here. If we apply distributivity to this, we'll get that this is equal to negative 1 times 1 plus negative 1 times negative 1. And this is the product that we're interested in here, okay? But we can work out the other things that we've got here, okay? Because on this side, we've got 1 plus negative 1. By definition, the multiplicative identity plus its additive inverse will give the additive identity. We know that negative 1 times 0 will equal 0. So the left-hand side, therefore, becomes equal to 0 here. Okay. Now, on the uh, right-hand side here, we've got negative 1 times 1. By definition, the multiplicative identity multiplies by anything to give that other thing back again. So this will equal negative 1. And then we've got the thing that we're so interested in, which is this product of negative 1 times negative 1, which we don't yet know what that is. But now, of course, we can just add 1 onto both sides, and we'll get that negative 1 times negative 1 is equal to 1. So that's the proof that negative 1 times negative 1 will always equal 1 uh, in any ring. So negative negative 1 is always a unit in any ring as well. Uh, it will be its own uh, multiplicative uh, inverse. Okay, so in the integers though, those are the only two units, 1 and negative 1. So in fact here, uh, we do have two, um, two products that involve units basically. So 7 is going to be irreducible, more generally any prime number is going to be irreducible. 
Okay, so you can only find products in this way uh, of uh, for an irreducible element, you can only find products that involve a unit multiplied by another element. And these other elements, which are uh, the elements which if you multiply by unit, you can get the irreducible element. These are known as the associate elements of R. Okay, so the associate elements. So negative 7 would be considered an associate element of 7. Really, it's all of the elements of R multiplied by units. Okay, so you have lots of units potentially in your more general commutative ring. What you can do for any element, and this doesn't just apply to um, irreducible elements, you can do this for any element. Okay, so if you have an arbitrary element in your non-zero commutative ring here, what you can do is you can collect together the set of all things of the form u times r, where u is a unit. Okay, so you can multiply your element r here by all of the units in your ring, and these elements are called the associate elements of your element r. Okay, and it's these elements that then can be the thing that you multiply by units in the case of an irreducible element to get that irreducible element back. Because of course, the fact that a unit is um, invertible, it has a multiplicative inverse, means that you can undo this multiplication by a unit. So if you take an associate element, you can then multiply it by the multiplicative inverse of that unit to arrive back at R, and that's effectively what you're doing uh, when you've got an irreducible element expressed as a m multiplication of two elements, uh, one of which will have to be an associate and the other will have to be a unit. Okay, so in this example here, 7 and negative 7, they're associate elements, and here I'm undoing uh, how I got negative 7 from 7. So I could get negative 7 from 7 by multiplying by the unit negative 1, and here I'm effectively undoing that by multiplying again by the multiplicative inverse of negative 1, which of course in this case is negative 1. Okay, uh, so there is an example of irreducible elements. Irreducible elements can only be written as a product of a unit with an associate element of verse themselves. They cannot be written in any other way. Okay, all other elements which can be written as a product of two elements, which neither of which is a unit and which doesn't involve necessarily an associate element, um, those are called reducible elements. Okay, so that's the definition of an irreducible element. Now let's have a look at the definition of a prime element. Okay, not to be confused with the definition of an irreducible element. Okay, so again, a prime element can be defined in an arbitrary commutative ring. We don't need our ring to have any more structure than just being a non-zero commutative ring. Okay, right. So, what then is the definition of a prime element? So, the first thing I must say is that we do not allow zero to be a prime element. So a prime element is not the additive identity, firstly, and it's a non-additive identity element such that the principal ideal generated by this element, so P is just some element of our non-zero commutative ring here, okay, it will be called a prime element if the principal ideal generated by P is a prime ideal. Okay, that's the definition of a prime in a non-zero commutative ring. It's a non-zero element such that the um, principal ideal generated by it is a prime ideal in your non-zero commutative ring. Okay, so um, we can instantly conclude from that that P is not a unit because remember a prime ideal, and I'll just remind you of the definition of a prime ideal. A prime ideal is first and foremost a proper ideal and then it has to have the property that uh, if you multiply together two elements that are outside of the prime ideal, the answer stays outside the prime ideal. It is not possible to multiply two elements outside the prime ideal and get uh, an element that's in the prime ideal. So I'll draw a picture for this. So if this is our non-zero commutative ring here, uh, then if this is going to be a prime ideal, so here's the principal ideal generated by P, if it's to be a prime ideal, what it means is that if you take two elements, A and B, outside of the prime ideal here, and multiply them together to get A times B, that must also be outside the prime ideal. The only way to multiply two elements together and get something that's in a prime ideal is if one or both of the elements that you multiply together are uh, in the prime ideal already. Okay? 
Uh, so that then is the uh, definition of a prime ideal, just a reminder of that definition of a prime ideal. Now, that means that P, we can conclude that a prime is not a unit. Okay, so a prime is not going to be a unit, and the reason it's not going to be a unit is that if you put a unit in an ideal, then you instantly put one in an ideal. Okay, so if you have a unit in an ideal, uh, then because all multiples of the unit are going to have to be in the ideal, because the ideal is closed uh, under multiplication by definition, uh, you can therefore conclude that one will be in the ideal, because one of the multiples of u will be by its multiplicative inverse, which will give you one. So from this you can conclude that one is an element of the ideal, and the instant you have one in the ideal, you have to have everything in the ideal. So if you have a unit in your ideal, you are the entire ring, basically. You're not a proper ideal, basically, or the unit ideal. Okay, so from this you can conclude that i is equal to the principal ideal generated by 1, the unit ideal. Okay, and we said that a prime ideal had to be a proper ideal. That's one of the parts of the definition here. So that means that units are not prime elements. So a prime element is not the additive identity, and it's not a unit element. It's an element where, when you generate the principal ideal generated by that element, you get a prime ideal. Okay, uh, now, in the case of the integers, the definition of a prime element overlaps with the definition of an irreducible element. Prime elements are irreducible elements in the context of the integers, and irreducible elements are prime elements. Okay, so the definitions, although they are different, in uh, the integers, which obeys a bunch of lovely properties, in particular it's a principal ideal domain, uh, uh, will these two definitions become one and the same, basically. If this is true, you can prove this is true. If this is true, you can prove this is true. Okay, so the definitions are utterly equivalent in uh, principal ideal domains, of which the integers is an example, and we'll show that later on. Uh, in a more general commutative ring, however, the two definitions are not the same, and I agree that this definition of irreducible is the definition that you will have probably learnt for years and years and years as the definition of a prime element, and that is confusing. Unfortunately, you do just have to get used to it. The definition of a prime element is this here, that when you generate uh, the principal ideal generated by that element, you get a prime ideal, one of these ideals where it's not possible to multiply two elements that are outside of it together and get something that's within it. Okay, so we'll have a break here, swallow these definitions, swallow the horror that um, they aren't necessarily how you would intuitively imagine them to be, and in the next video what we'll discuss is the, what these definitions, how these definitions relate to one another in fancy rings. So we'll firstly have a look at what happens in integral domains, and then we'll have a look at what happens in principal ideal domains, and we'll see how they become the same one and the same, basically, in a principal ideal domain.